ready to do this lesson. Untie the donkey. Our focal passage is from Matthew 21, the first three verses. And it says, when they, and this is Jesus and his disciples, when they had approached Jerusalem and they come to Bethphage and they're at the Mount of Olives, he's going to send two disciples on a mission. So I want you to look at the map and I want you to see Bethphage is in the blue rectangle. You find it? Okay, this is right by the Mount of Olives. Do you see also, if you can follow the little green squiggly line to the red, rectang red rectangle, Jesus is on his way to enter Jerusalem Palm Sunday. So we're going into the week where Jesus is going to be crucified, buried, and raised again. So that's our context and our setting of this passage of Scripture. Now, here's what he says to them, to these two disciples. I want you to go into the village that's right in front of you. And immediately, you're going to find a donkey tied and a colt is with her. Untie them. Bring them to me. And if anyone asks you, here's what you're going to say. The Lord needs who? Them. And he, that person, will send them at once. Now you've noticed that I've emphasized them. That's very important in this lesson. Now, God has a plan for this little donkey and the colt, the mother and the colt. Jesus and his disciples notice they go to the exact place to get that exact donkey who's waiting for Jesus. So he's in, do we believe in God's sovereignty? Yes, and we believe God has a plan even for this little donkey. So that's what's happening here. So there's some interesting notes I found just in this short passage here. And when you compare Matthew's account with Mark and Luke, you need all three accounts to get all of your facts together. First of all, Matthew's the only one that tells you there's a mother donkey. And boy, is she going to be important. We've got to have mother donkey. Matthew also is going to tie this to a prophecy from Zechariah. This is very important in this passage. But Mark and Luke are going to will give you a little bit of extra information. No one's ever sat on this little donkey. On the little donkey. Now, some other things I noticed. Jesus knew exactly where this little donkey was. He knew. And this just really blew in my face. The disciples didn't ask him why. Didn't question why are we going in to get that donkey, and it's a specific donkey? What are you going to do with the donkey? You know, that would have been me years ago asking all the questions. Now, they simply obeyed, and they left and to, to go get the donkey and untie the donkey and bring it to Jesus. Now, doesn't it seem odd? It seemed odd to me. Jesus and his disciples have been way up at the Sea of Galilee. They have been walking and walking and walking for 80 to 90 miles, making their way down to this area. And he's been walking, and he's only two miles from his destination. And now he says, I want a donkey. You've been walking for 80 or 90 miles, and now you need a donkey. See, that just seems odd, doesn't it? Unless you know prophecy. And you know the Bible. So Jesus knows he's going to be fulfilling prophecy. And we have to go back 550 years to see the prophecy. Jesus, did he always fulfill prophecy? As they say, every jot and tittle. Absolutely. So it's like the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T. He had to fulfill it literally. He's carefully planning his entrance into Jerusalem by fulfilling prophecy. He's riding this donkey, and he is going to be echoing the regal arrival that Zechariah's prophecy is all about. Mark and Luke don't tell you about the prophecy, but Matthew does. 
And here are the words from Zechariah 550 years earlier before this event. He says in Zechariah 9, People, your king is going to be coming to you. And this is how you will know it. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Now you're going to see that this prophecy is also in Handel's Messiah. This is one of the songs in it. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He's righteous. He has salvation. He's humble. He's mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the donkey. We've got to have both. All right. Now, why is he not coming in on a big old white stallion? Because the kings in the Old Testament, they only rode a horse if they were going to go to war. They came in on a donkey if they were going to come in peace. Now, go back to King David with me. King David is on his deathbed. And he has a son over here that wants to usurp the throne and be the next king. But he knows who is supposed to be the next king. Solomon. And so this one over here is trying to give trouble. He tells him on his deathbed, go get my donkey. See, David had a donkey. He said, go get my donkey, put Solomon on the donkey, and take him over to the Gihon Spring. Now, if you've been with me very long, you know the significance of the Gihon Spring. And he said, and have him anoint him right there to be king on the donkey at the Gihon Spring. Now, so we're back to this week, Passover week. And the people seeing Jesus riding into the city on this donkey, they should understand what that meant. It's a sign of kingship. It's a sign of royalty. Were they looking for a king to come and free them from Roman rule? Yeah. So he is going to come in, and this is what they will think, and they're thinking about that prophecy. And it says in verse 9, just a few verses later, the crowds, there's crowds going ahead of Jesus, there's crowds behind him, and they're shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. God has a plan for not only the mother donkey, but also little donkey, the colt. This little donkey, a colt, is a never used animal. And he's prepared for a very special purpose in what is going to be one of the most important times in all of eternity. This is a crucial time in history, the coming of Jesus Christ into the city of Jerusalem to fulfill what God wanted him to do. Now, in this one little colt, we're going to see the evidence God's faithful to his promises. We see that here. He's spanning thousands of years assuring us Christ's kingship is the Messiah. That's what that would mean, coming in on the donkey. Royalty coming in peace. And he's also coming before the week is over will they know this was the Lamb of God who is the propitiation. He came to take our place, to die for us and be our substitute. Now, before this donkey was ever born or even thought about, he was designed by God in his sovereign plan that that donkey is going to be in this place and he's existing for such a time as this. You believe that? I do, because I believe in God's sovereignty. Now, this reminded me of Esther. She had, Esther, remember, is a Jew... And so is Mordecai. And so they are Jews, but people don't know it. Because she is the queen over here in Persia. So this is pagan. And these are the people that are ruling right now. But here we have a couple of Jews who are over here. And so she has been made queen, right? He chose her, and she is now the queen in Persia. And Mordecai comes to her and he says, Esther, you could remain silent at this time because what's getting ready to happen? Haman has a decree going out and he wants to eliminate the Jewish people totally, get rid of them. 
And Mordecai says, Esther, you have an opportunity to save your people. He seems to know how God works. And he says to her, if you remain silent right now, relief for your people, can God use somebody else if you refuse? He you. He can. He may use somebody else. But Esther, you have the opportunity for such a time as this to speak up, don't be silent, and God will use you to save these people. But he says, if you remain silent, believe me, he can use somebody else because they will arise for the Jews from another place. So if we remain silent when God has a purpose for us, he could use someone else. When he put me here, are you here for a certain purpose? And he says, who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. God put her there, ready to go, but she could have kept quiet. But God would have used someone else. Okay, now... God put her in that place, and in his good time, he's going to use her for his purpose. Now, do you believe in coincidences? I'm not too much of a coincidence person, but I do believe in the sovereignty of God. So I thought of another couple examples. Go with me to Jericho. Rahab the harlot is a pagan. She lives in Jericho, which was the most fortified city that the children of Israel were going to have to defeat. Rahab, do you remember what she told the two spies? We know what your God did 40 years ago in parting the Red Sea. We heard about how your God gave you victory over King Og and King Bashan on the other side of the Jordan. We know that the land we live in, your God gave to the nation of Israel. She knew all that. And she, she did believe it. She lived in the city, and where she lived was in the wall, so she would be there to let the two spies down. Not a coincidence. And the faith that had already been built in her, what she knew. Think about David. His brothers, David's this little shepherd boy, and his brothers are all out in the valley of Elah, and they are fighting against the Philistines. And they have Goliath coming out there day after day, taunting the children of Israel. All of the people in Israel are scared to death. So one day, Jesse, the father, says, Here, David, I've got some food ready. Take it to your brothers over there. He showed up at the right time, the right place, and God used him. He took a sling, and he ran towards the giant. He was the aggressor, and he said, I come to you in the name of the God of Israel. So God used him to defeat. And then the widow who, was, who fed Elijah Remember, she only had enough stuff to make she and her little boy a cake, and then they were going to die because they had nothing. She's gathering sticks. Elijah comes along, and he says, make me one first, and she did. And what happened? Her supply never ran out. And then when her little boy died, Elijah was there to give him life again. So there's sovereignty of God for people to be in the right place at the right time. God maneuvered these just like the little donkey into just the right place. And when he's ready to incorporate them into his plan, you're there, ready to go. So I have some interesting facts about this little donkey. Number one, this little donkey is insignificant. And I'm just going to tell you up front, you and I are the little donkey. So I want you to, every time we talk about the little donkey, think about yourself, okay? Little donkey, most people think he's just insignificant. Most of us have probably felt that about ourselves most of our life. Now, he's an ordinary donkey. He's not full grown. Oh, and they didn't have this stud donkey where you would take your female and we're going to make a king carrying donkey. No, we didn't have that. He wasn't trained in a royal stable for donkeys. This little donkey's never been ridden. Just this plain, ordinary little donkey. No one took notice of this donkey. So his potential, he's all tied up. Seems like his potential is wasting. He's not useful. 
because he's all tied up. Number two, to be useful, he's got to be untied. So he has to get untied. Now, nobody believed, that donkey over there, nobody believed that donkey could be useful, let alone he's going to be the one that will carry the king of kings into Jerusalem? No way. You know, people wouldn't have believed that about this little donkey. Most of us are like little donkey. We get tied down by things that will limit our service to the Lord. Are y'all thinking of some things? I have some ideas. First of all, people can get tied down to their possessions. It's true. Always having to have bigger and better. You got to keep up with the Joneses. HGTV tells me that my color is not popular anymore. This is the new color. Uh, it, it can go on and on. So we can get tied to stuff like that. And then we, some of us have to drive the right car. I will just tell you, <laughs> our car this year is 30 years old. We still have a Buick LeSabre Limited and it still looks really good. <laughs> it does, but I think it's 30, a 2003, 13, 20, sorry. It's only 20 years old, so we'll, we'll have it a few more years, I'm sure. You, you possessions, you cannot keep up with everybody. That will drive you nuts, you know, trying to keep up with the latest thing. Now, I want y'all to look at this picture, and I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds. Some of you are getting it. <laughs> okay. Do you see this is a horse? And he stays right where he's supposed to, and he's tied to a little blue plastic chair. And he won't move. Sometimes the chains that prevent us from being free are more mental. Does he think he can't move? Yeah. So the chains can be more mental than they actually are physical. Oh, some of us have had to deal with roots of bitterness. I told you I had to have a roto-rooter job when I first really surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ and roto-rooter time because we can have roots of bitterness. We can have bitterness about things that happened in our past, the way somebody treated me. You know, all different kinds of things can start this root of bitterness. And we see this tree here. The root of this tree is bitterness. And what's the fruit of a tree that has a root of bitterness? Wrath, anger, clamor, malice, slander, all kinds of things that should not be in a Christian's life. Someone that's filled with the Holy Spirit and you have the life of Jesus Christ in you, those things should not be part of your life. And so many of us have to deal with root of bitterness and let God wash all that away. We have to come to him and submit to him and ask for forgiveness on that. Some of us are bound up with anxieties. You get anxious about things. You're bound to a sense of unworthiness which leads to hopelessness. You can be under a lot of stress and this will get you all bound up. Because does Jesus promise to deliver you from all this? He does. So if you're still dealing with all this, it may be time that you need to go back to the dung gate. You know, you don't ever leave there, remember? Yeah, and so you, these are things that if they're giving you problems and keeping you uh, all bound up and tied up, these are things that you need to be delivered from. Fear, you know, fear of the future. Fear of what's going to be happening. Uh, you know, right now, I could except I've been dealing with it, I could be under a lot of anxious fear and stress about Laura. I could. But I tell you, when you give all that to Jesus, he gives you a peace that you can't even describe. Because I know what I know. You know, and so I know he is going to. It's his plan, it's his purpose, and I know he will take care of it in his time. Oh, some of us have had broken relationships in the past. You know, some of us have had relationships that we've been enjoying even in our adult life, and something has happened to uh, 
that that relationship is not what it was. We're in distress over it. A lot of negative emotions can come out of us, like depression and jealousy and grief, envy, guilt, frustration, fear, sadness, shame, despair, and doubt. So we, a lot of us have to deal with negative emotions because that's not a fruit of the Spirit. Those should not be in our lives. Here's another picture for you to dwell on for a minute. Some of you are getting it now. Now, this donkey has no use right now. Do you agree? He, nobody can use him because he is burdened down. He's carrying way more than he can. So, anybody wanting to come hire that donkey for a purpose? No, you'll pass him up because he's burdened down. This made me think of a song that I learned when I was a kid singing in church. You probably know it. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. You don't pick it up and keep carrying it around with you or you're going to be like that donkey. And if you're tied down to all these burdens, it would be hard for God to use you. So we have to get free from those. And I know it's hard. Take it to the Lord and leave it. There's also a verse that says, I'm going to cast all my cares on him because he cares for me because I trust in him. Now, you don't cast them and then reel them back in. And there's also a verse in Psalm that says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because you trust in him you've got to keep your mind stayed on him not on your burden and I know it's hard it takes discipline you've got to keep your mind stayed on him now many people are burdened down by sins passed in their life and Satan will love to bring them up to you he will love to just whisper in your ear and talk about them, and you can stay tied to those. Has, have you asked forgiveness? Did Jesus forgive you? Yes. He says they're gone as far as the depths of the sea, east to west. But Satan says, I don't think so. And so he'll whisper poison in your ear and bring them up all the time, and you will be weighed down with a burden of guilt. We are not supposed to be burdened down with that. Now, we can become burdened down and selfish with our time and our energy. If you look at my picture at the bottom there, do you see this person comes to a fork in the road? God has a plan for me. He has a plan for you. But sometimes we want to go this way and we think about, I want to do this. This plan for my life. And I can become very selfish with my time and my energy. Now, I've used this illustration before, but it's really a good one, so I'm going to repeat it. Several years ago, this was before Laura came home, so it's been quite a few years, I was teaching the Bible study in the Whistler girl's house, their parents' house. And Doug, their dad, came to me, and he said, Frank Zane, I want you to go teach a Bible study to Barbara Kane and her group. And I said, okay. And he said, I want you to teach for about eight weeks on the judgment seat of Christ. They need to hear it. And I thought, <laughs> okay. So I did. And so I began going week after week and teaching on the judgment seat of Christ at Barbara's house and her group from her church. So one night, I'm on my way there. And y'all know me, I'm early everywhere I go. I'm always early. So, but I came at a Rolling Hills edition. Now, can y'all visualize with me? I'm at the stop sign to turn on No Water Road. And I'm going to have to turn west and go towards Highway 75. Okay, when I come at the stop sign, cemetery is right there. And I see a lady sitting on a bench out there all by herself. And I'm sitting there in the car waiting. And it came into my heart. Go talk to her. See if there's anything that you can pray with her about. And I thought, I don't have time. I'm on my way to go teach Bible study. 
you know, I don't want to be late. And so I turned, and I'm, going, I'm getting closer to the entrance of the cemetery. And it became so heavy on my heart. Go in and talk to her. And I drove on by. See, I had been praying that God, God, I want you to use me. Give me opportunities. He gave me one. And I did not take advantage of it. And as I drove on past going to Barbara's house, that was in the back of my mind. I thought you wanted me to use you. No, I thought you wanted me, yeah, to use you. And it's like I got an F on the test. See, he does put things into our life. When we ask him, I want you to use me, you know, give me opportunities, he does, and then what do we do with it? We cannot be selfish with our time or our energy. So that, I had to go to the dung gate over that. You know, that is a confession. Lord, you know, I grieved over that, you know, and so will you give me other opportunities? Now, we also can get all tied up because some of you, like me, have hard-headed and you have a real independent spirit. And so I got off on this track much of my adult life, as y'all know, working so God will approve of me. You know, I just have to make an A on my report card. It, that was always me. You know, and so I do this and I check my box. I do this and I check my box. I do something else and I check my box. That's how I spent some of my life. You will be bound up to rules and all these activities and the things you have to do. You feel like, I have to do these because I'm a Christian. No, God has works for you that are different than the works for me. Is that true? Yes. So we all are impressed with different things to do and we do those things. I didn't have to do everything that everybody else thought I should be doing. That's what burned me out. I learned another song when I was a little girl. And do you see on my slide now, the ropes are untied. Let go and let God have his wonderful way. Let go and let God have his way. Your sorrows will vanish, your night turn to day. Let go and let God have his way. We must untie our life and let go and let Jesus use us in the way he desires to use each of us. Because the Lord needs each of us just as much as he needed that little donkey. And we need to be doing his work and be ready and in position so when he lays something on your heart, you're ready to go. Now, number three, this donkey has to be broken before he can be used. He's gotta be broken so what happens if you try to ride an animal that has not been broken in? He's going to resist, he's going to buck, and he's going to jump. He does not want to be ridden, right? They don't want that bridle, the bit and bridle in their mouth. They don't want to be led. They just want to be who they are. They want to be wild. So number three, he's got to be broken. Why do I know this? And I did not realize this. Genesis 9, 1 and 2. Noah and them have just come out of the ark after the flood. And in verse 1 of chapter 9, God blessed Noah, his sons. He said, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you will be upon every beast of the earth. So all of the animals were going to be, have the fear of man on them after the flood. So these little donkeys, just like you and me, they had to be broken, they had to be trained to accept people and not be afraid of them because the Bible tells us they had an innate fear of man. So they've gotta be broken, they've gotta to learn to trust that. Animals in large groups of people, they can get spooked. And you see that on the Westerns on television. They can get spooked. Now, here's a question for us, ladies. When God chooses to use me in a particular way, do I have to get past my fear of people and what they're going to think of me? Oh boy, that was one of my terrible traits growing up and even into my adult life. What are people going to think of me? 
So I would do things to become a person's friend because I thought if I don't do it, they won't be my friend. Well, that's not a friend anyway. Yeah, but I was caught in all that, getting past the fear of what people will think of you. Now, we're going to go to Jacob. He's a guy that I identify with. And probably some of you do too. I want this just, now, they, these are some new things I added from just, I've learned about three new things this time that I didn't do in June. God broke Jacob, and I want you to look at the verse in the Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews eleven twenty one. By faith, Jacob, he's dying. He was able to bless each of Joseph's sons, and he's worshiping as he leaned on the top of his staff. That's the verse about Jacob. Now, the worship of Jacob on the staff, how did he arrive at this point? Let's go back to when Jacob and Esau were the boys, and they were living with mom and dad. Okay, y'all with me? Okay. We know that they were twins, but we know Esau was slightly older. Now, many years before this, he deceitfully acquired Esau's birthright, and he deceitfully acquired Esau's blessing. Y'all remember that? Now, is Esau mad? Yes, and so they're afraid he's going to be out to kill him, so Jacob and Mama make a, make a plan. See, they had a plan. They made a plan, and they're going to send him out of the land, and he's going to go live over here with Uncle Laban for 20 years. He's going to get Leah first, and then he's going to get Rachel. But in this 20 years, he's going to amass a lot of servants. He's going to amass wealth and a lot of kids. And then God comes to him after 20 years and says, it is time for you to go home. So that's where we are in this. So don't you know he has a fear of how Esau's going to meet him? Sure. And so on his trip back home, he stays the night by himself. The Bible tells us he's alone at the bank of the Jabbok River. And I thought, why did they tell me what river he's at? Well, I dug into this, and I found out why. This is a crucial crisis in Jacob's life. And remember, God's calling him to go back where? Into the land, into his inheritance. Okay, night falls, and he's got all, both wives and all of the servants, all of the animals, they're all on the other side, and he's all over here by himself. Night falls, and a mysterious stranger suddenly appears, wrestles with Jacob until the breaking of day, because he's got to break that independent spirit. Have you ever had a wrestling match? Not many of you seem to have had one. I did. Breaking of that independent spirit. Leonard Ravenhill says, everyone wants to be clothed with power, but no one wants to be stripped of self. That's a great quote. Now, night's fallen, and he's having this wrestling match, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, what did he have to do to Jacob to finally put him under? He had to dislocate his hip. And so the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestles. Now what happens? This is a wrestling match that God, I think it was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, and he is wrestling Jacob. He's getting ready to go back into the promised land. Okay, he's been living out of the land, and he's going to come back. You've got to get rid of that independent spirit, boy. And so he has this wrestling match to break him of that. And what is the goal? Get rid, get rid of your self-sufficiency. Many of us have had to get rid of that self-sufficiency spirit, thinking we have a plan we can do. Now, I want us to go to the Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews eleven thirty nine. It says, these people all gained approval through what? Faith. 
And it says, this is the record of some of these people in the Old Testament. They shut lions' mouths. They raised the dead. They were tortured. They were stoned. They were sawn in half. They lived in caves. They were destitute. These are the people who are recorded in the Hall of Faith. And then it says, by faith, Jacob, he's dying. He blesses each of his sons of Joseph, and he worships leaning on his staff. And you think... He's listed in there for that? When we've just seen all these other things that were spectacular feats of faith? And so the question is asked, is what Jacob did, is it truly a miracle of faith? Absolutely it is. Because why? The staff became necessary to Jacob. He had to lean, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Jesus is our staff. And so it became necessary for him to learn to lean on his staff because they had to dislocate his thigh in order for him to come to that point. But that's a miraculous feat for someone to be to give in and they are no longer self-sufficient and independent. They will finally submit themselves and get rid of that self-sufficient spirit. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. Because it's very hard for some people to give up that independent spirit. And this is notice Jacob's testimony later in his life. And I thought, Francine, you're so much like him. You know, it was later in life when I finally surrendered fully that independent spirit. When God brought something into my life and I had no plan. God meets every one of us at the level he finds us. He promises us because I want to lift you up to where, you, where he wants us to be. But we have to humble ourselves before him first. Leaning upon the staff, every time he holds that staff, he's going to remember the miracle God had wrought in his life. Breaking that stubborn self-will. It symbolized his helplessness, the song, moment by moment. I trust in him. Moment by moment. Somebody wrote the song, I need thee every hour. Then somebody wrote, moment by moment. So we need him all the time, relying on him. He worshiped God as a broken man. And then he began to glory in his weakness in that infirmity that God had brought into his life. Sounds just like the Apostle Paul. I want to glory in my weaknesses, my infirmities. Why? So the power of Jesus Christ will rest on me. It symbolized his helpless moment-by-moment dependence on God. And he comes to the conclusion, just like I have, what a wonderful thing to be purged by God. He loved me enough and cared about me enough, he didn't want to leave me in that state. He wanted me to come to that place of absolute surrender. Get rid of that self-sufficiency. Because why? When you do that, it will, re- it will result in you being fruitful for the Lord. Now, here's something else new I learned. This was fascinating. Now, do you see my map in the Jabbok River is right there in the red uh, rectangle box. Jabbok is Strong's word H2999. And it means emptying pouring forth. Now, if you look at the little box where Jabbok River is, this is where Jacob's going to have his wrestling match and give in. Do you see the long rectangular box with water droplets in it? That's the Jordan River. Do you see how close he is to the Jordan? And then he's going to cross back over and go home into his inheritance in the promised land. Okay, now... The Jabbok River is one of the principal tributaries of the Jordan River, and it's one of the major water courses to get into the promised land. He's going to have his wrestling match right there. You can't go in here and enjoy your inheritance for you and I, our abundant life, till you have a Jabbok River experience. You've got to come to a place where you will have full surrender to Jesus Christ And you get rid of that self-sufficiency and you learn to depend on him. Before he enters the promised land, before you and I can live the abundant life, we have to empty ourselves 
and yield to the Lord Jesus Christ in everything and become dependent upon him. So here we are, back to the potter's wheel. This is where you get rid of self-sufficiency. You empty yourself. You pour yourself out. And then you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you will have victory over sin in your life and over the circumstances of your life. This is unflinching obedience. Unflinching obedience to the difficult commands of God. You learn to trust Jesus Christ and it's a lifelong process of surrendering to him. Being on the potter's wheel in this posture, bowed and humbled before him, this is also symbolic of the dung gate. This is your posture. Number four, donkeys have a reputation of not working or cooperating until they trust the one for whom they work. Now, y'all can see where all this is going now. Now, when the disciples brought this little colt to Jesus, the colt immediately trusted Jesus. And he carried him down the path into the city. Now, for Jesus to come into Jerusalem in this manner, it was miraculous. All this crowd, all these people watching, oh, I can't believe that donkey. He's, he's not fearful. He's not, you know, he's not bucking around. And he's never been ridden. So it was a miracle that this happened. So you can see the picture in the upper right corner. Jesus rides this new little colt that's never been ridden. He goes through a yelling, joyous crowd of people. They're throwing down their coats and their palm branches. It should be impossible. But this little donkey, he's got the Jesus Christ on him. He's a humble king with authority over all things, even the animals that he's created. Jesus is very gentle in his authority. He heals the donkey of its fear. You know, Laura has had to go out and speak to eight and 10,000 women at a time. But God has given her a boldness. He's given her everything she needs. He's equipped her to be able to speak to large groups without fear. So, and that makes you useful for him. If it, whatever he calls you to do, will he equip you? Absolutely. So with Jesus riding this little donkey in control, the beast becomes completely fearless in the midst of the crowd. And I think about Laura going into places where the crowd is hostile, but yet she's still fearless. Now, I don't understand why God has brought this illness into her life, but I know he's not done with her. And I know he will heal her in some way in his time. Now, if Jesus can do this for a little donkey, how much more for his people? How much more should we present ourselves for his service? Because whatever he calls you to do, he will take care of your fear, your anxiety, your whatever that you would have. But you've got to trust in Christ's humble authority to take care of, to lead me, to make me fearless in any circumstance. And he will do it for each of us. He'll do it for each of us. So here are some things we've learned so far. First of all, this little donkey, he's got to be untied, he's got to be broken, and he's got to trust Jesus for everything. That's you and me. Same thing for us. Now, you may go years not understanding or not knowing what your purpose is, right? Now, all of us as believers, we know part of our purpose is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's all of us. But then each of us will have specific purposes where God's going to use all of us in the body of Christ so the body of Christ functions very well. Now, go back to 2008. And here I am sitting in the Whistler's basement. They finally got me to go to Bible study. So I began going, and I tell you, the first time I went, God put a hunger for his word in me, and I prayed, give me a hunger for your word that can't be satisfied, and he has, and he will do it for you. If you pray that, he will answer that because that's his will. 
He wants you in his word, and he will give you a hunger. So I'm in this group of uh, women in a basement in 2008, just soaking it up, learning everything I could, just, you know, not knowing what's around the corner. But God's preparing me. So you can think about here I am, and God's plan is loading. He's got me in the basement learning, and I'm soaked up in his word, and his plan is loading for me. He's got a purpose for me, and he had a plan ordained for me. And I have to be ready. I have to be under the power and the control of the Holy Spirit because there's going to come a time in my life, God says, I need you right now. So you get prepared, you're ready, because when that door opens, you need to be ready to go, whatever opportunity he gives you. In July of 2008 was a real turning point in my life where I entered the darkest valley I've ever experienced in my whole life. And before I put my head on the pillow that night, I was in that attitude, I was having a Jabbok River experience, just like Jacob, where I totally surrendered everything because I have no plan now. Laura has come out to us that she is changing herself into a man. This is a crisis that devastated me to the core of my soul. It was devastating. So we're at a restaurant one night, and this is a picture of how Laura looked that night when she came in the restaurant. And that was the attitude on her face. And I said, Laura, are you trying to look like a man? And with tears streaming down her face, she said, yes, Mom, I am. You cannot even imagine how I felt inside. And I'm in a public restaurant. And I wanted to say, how could you do this to us? Because we had already had 10 years of yuck with her, and we thought we had her in a good place, and now there's something else. So you have that elephant sitting on your chest, and you feel... You just feel like, I just want to escape life. I I just don't know if I can handle this. And so I felt the fear well up within me. And I thought, I can't even breathe. I was struggling to breathe because it was just devastating. Over the next couple of days at home, I'm looking at some of the family albums. And I think, what do you do with 25 years of family pictures? What do I do with all those pictures of Laura growing up? What do I do with all of this stuff in the baby book? Because I actually began grieving the death of a daughter. And somebody said, Francine, she's still alive. Not really. If you haven't gone through this, that child is actually dead. And I found out when she came back and wanted to reinstate herself as Laura, you go to the courthouse and check the records, I never had a little girl named Laura Beth Perry on September 3rd of 82. Totally erased from the records. Totally. And it cost several hundred dollars and over two years to get a birth certificate that was true. This was a very hard time. I said, they don't don't even recognize that I ever had a little girl named Laura. She doesn't exist. Satan is so good about coming to each of us. And he says, he's going to steal your hope. And he began to whisper in my ear, Francine, things are never going to get any better. It's always going to be like this. And you know, it's very easy when you're feeling like I was to believe the lies. Because you sure don't see a light at the end of the tunnel for this. Not at all. Now, Spurgeon says, before God can use a man greatly, he first has to break the man. And we all have a built-in propensity to trust in ourselves. All of us. Someone else said, men will throw away broken things. But God never uses anything until he first breaks it. So if God has brought you to a place where he's trying to break you like he did me, 
be encouraged because he's getting ready to use you for something when you let him break you. So here I am, and going down this very dark journey, and I needed to be untied, I needed to be broken, and I needed to learn to trust Jesus Christ in this circumstance. Give it all to him. I don't know how you're going to fix her, but I know I can't. You know, so everything has to go to Jesus. Then I began studying Luke 22 with the sifting of Peter. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you because he wants to sift you as wheat. Now, sifting wheat is a metaphor to shake something apart to break a person down. So was this experience, did Satan want to break me totally down using this? Sure. So Satan wished, wished to shake Peter's faith so forcefully that he would fall, proving that God's faithful servant Peter was lacking and he would not be able to withstand the sifting. When you sift wheat, you take wheat or some other grain and you sift it through a sieve or a large strainer and they shake it violently. Believe me, I felt like I was being shaken violently. So the dirt and the other impurities that cling to all the grain during the threshing process, it begins to separate the good from the usable grain. And only what's left after the sifting is what can be used. So here I am. Y'all know me on that little wheel like a type A hamster. This is the way I was. All my spiritual activity, my plans, being self-sufficient and independent, all of this has got to go. So this had to be sifted out of me, we'll say. Now, what else? Y'all know I struggled with jealousy and envy, critical spirit, and so forth. And so here's the picture of a people pleaser down here. And he says, what are the people going to think? What if I say no? Are we still going to be friends? Will they get mad at me? I just wished I could say no to people. See, so these were some of my emotions uh, before all of this. So Satan's goal, he wants to crush us, he wants to wreck our faith and destroy the faith of every believer because he wants none of us to be a testimony to the grace of God and to the power of God in our lives. He wants to destroy our testimony. So I want you to notice something here. Jesus didn't even promise to remove Peter's test he said I'm not removing the test from you but what did he say these words are such an encouragement because Jesus told Peter I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail know that Jesus is interceding for us so when we go through things He's interceding that our faith would not fail. And notice the next phrase, when you return to me, not if. When you return to me, then you'll strengthen your brethren. That is a great thing to tell somebody who's going through a dark trial. Jesus is praying for you that your faith won't fail, and when you come back to him, you will strengthen the brethren. That's just such an awesome thing. Remember, Satan's power to sift Peter as wheat was limited by Christ's intercession. When he comes after us, we should remember, Jesus Christ lives to intercede for us. Now, the provision for the donkey, number five. The donkey colt is all tied up with his mother. And Matthew's the only one that tells you that, but this is a wonderful point that we're going to learn here imagine if this little donkey has been yanked away and expected i gotta go carry the messiah all by myself imagine if he's expected to fill his destiny all alone we have this little colt if that little colt had been put through that kind of situation he probably would not have fulfilled his destiny yeah just hold on he would have probably run erratic through the streets and thrown Jesus off because that's how those animals would have been acting. Now, he would have caused a scene, but it would have been a scene of a different sort. But look at God's provision. Jesus considered the frailties, the insecurity of the little donkey, 
And only Matthew records the donkey's mother's taken along with him to give him the comfort that he needs of his mother's company. He would go through new experiences that day, some things he had never gone through. He's never been ridden before, but he's not going to have to go through it all alone. He's got his mama by his side. This is God's provision because he's going to walk away today that he's never walked before. He's never done this before. So God's provision for me, Francine, you're going to get out of your comfort zone. Boy, <laughs> boy, did I get out of my comfort zone. When God calls us to our, fulfill the destiny that he has for us, how he's going to use us, it may be uncomfortable. We have to endure new experiences and new hardships, things we've never done before. This path was set for me before I was born. Do y'all believe that? But my circumstances were so uncomfortable. I felt stretched to my limit. And I thought, I cannot handle another thing. Transgender was rarely heard of. I didn't even know what it was. And Laura had uh, been taking testosterone for a year before we ever knew it. So she was well into the transition. And I thought, I don't even know what this is. You think you can become a man? So I'm way out of my comfort zone. And believe me, when all of my peers started finding out, boy, was I uncomfortable. Because I didn't want anybody to know. But she showed up at church one day. And out in the foyer... She's got a beard and everything. And people said, who's that with you? That is Laura. I was way out of my comfort zone. Y'all cannot even imagine how hard that was. In front of my friends, in front of my church. I began, Lord, how long? He doesn't tell you how long. But he says he will be with you the whole way. I remember when I... All this first started, and I felt so hopeless. I just kind of felt God. You know, he has a sense of humor. So here I am feeling kind of down in the pit, and just in my heart, all of a sudden, it says, okay, Francine, what's your plan? You always have a plan. <laughs> and I just said, oh, okay, Lord, I don't have one. You've given me something, I don't have a plan. And he said, Great. He said, because now you're on the road to absolute surrender. He has to bring different things into our lives, so we are willing to just come before him for absolute surrender. Nancy Lee DeMoss has a definition of absolute surrender. She says, brokenness is the shattering of my self-will, the absolute surrender of my will to the will of God. It's saying, yes, Lord. No resistance, no chafing, no stubbornness, simply submitting myself to his direction and his will in my life. Period. It's unflinching obedience to the difficult commands that God makes on us. We have to learn to trust him. You know he's preparing us to serve in his kingdom. It is a lifelong process of surrendering to him. Jesus, I love this part. Jesus promised his own presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. This is Mother Donkey. As we embark upon a journey that he's laid out for us, he understands my frailties and my limits in all of this. But God's provision for the donkey, untie them, bring them to me. I need them, both so what does that tell me? As the donkey had his mother to comfort him, we also, as we engage in the life and the trials that God puts before us, he needs us with the Holy Spirit. He has the Holy Spirit to comfort and to guide us. He says in John 14, I pray the Father that he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't know him and it doesn't see him, but you know him because he dwells within you. He will be in you. And he promises, I will not leave you comfortless. 
I will come to you. So in our circumstances, me traveling this journey, he needs to use me and fulfill his purposes in me. He said, Francine, I need you with the Holy Spirit. I need them. Bring both of them to me. The Holy Spirit will lead, he will comfort, he will guide me through everything that he has me go through. So you have to submit to the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve him. You can't quit him. If your vessel gets all clogged up, how can he have control of you? How can he give you victory? He can't. Oh, it's time to go to the dung gate. So we have to get our vessel clean, right? Get on the potter's wheel, right? And then he is able to do the work in us. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything. Oh, boy. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you let your request be made known unto God, and here's your promise. The peace of God which passes all understanding, it's going to keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Here is what I had to be thankful for. This is a picture of Laura years ago. Beard. It's hard. And I said, Lord, I have to be thankful for everything. He said, everything. Everything. Because he has a promise that'll go with it. And so I learned from the Apostle Paul, this is a four-step process. Find the promise. Because I needed the peace that would guard my heart and my mind. Find the promise, and then I reckon on it. God, I am counting on this because reckon is a banking, banking term. So I'm counting on the fact that you will give me the peace that you promised if I give thanks in everything. Then you will. And I yield to you now and I thank you that you're going to give me that peace. So you can learn to be thankful for the situation, the circumstance. And then you promise, you'll give me a peace in all of that. And I declare to you, he did. Because he had me teaching for years what I teach now before she ever came home. And he gave me a peace that passed all understanding. He says, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, it will come, it will guard your heart, it will guard your mind in Christ Jesus. So, I made a conscious decision. Now, I didn't feel different immediately. No. But you keep standing on the fact of God's word. You keep standing on the promises that if I would surrender myself to him, he would promise to do the work. And he did. Now, I could feel, I knew that God was changing me, and I knew that he was growing me. Hopefully, you have been able to tell that God's changing you. He's beginning to produce the fruit of the Spirit in you. And you're not having to do it yourself because you can't. So I'd show up every morning for him to work in me. I have a little potter's wheel that uh, Paula gave me. I have a little potter's wheel right by my computer. And so that reminds me every morning, this is where I go. Every morning, get on the potter's wheel for him to work in me. Get in the word because it's the pot. this washes over me, but I need to be on the potter's wheel, surrendered to him with a clean vessel, start getting in his word, surrendered to the Holy Spirit, and what happens? It's a miracle. He starts changing me. He starts growing me. He gives me victory. He gives me peace. So, ladies, it is not something we can imitate. I cannot imitate Jesus Christ. You might try for a while, and you might be successful a little here and there, but we cannot in our flesh be Jesus. But I tell you what, he can transform us. He transforms us. Let Christ be seen in us. Let him produce the fruit of the Spirit in you through the power of the living word. So my circumstances weren't changing, but I was. And that's the key. The circumstances may not change for a long time, but you need to be changing to have the victory and the peace. So number six, we're almost done. The Lord has need of him. Wow, 
This is going to change that donkey's significance. Now what happens? This little donkey becomes an important special donkey, but it's nothing of his own ability. Nothing of his own ability. The Lord intended to use this donkey, and everything's going to bring glory to Jesus. And that's the purpose of our lives, to worship him and bring glory to him. So God's little plan for the donkey, God's plan for the little donkey, when Jesus sat on the donkey, his status changed. And the donkey's now under control. He's untied. He's broken. He's trusting Jesus. He was to be the mode. This is important. This little donkey was chosen to be the mode of carrying the Messiah, the King, the Savior, to his fulfillment of his purpose on this earth. If the little donkey had never been untied, his destiny, his purpose would have never been fulfilled. Never. He had the privilege of bringing Jesus to the people. He exalted Jesus. That's what you and I are supposed to do. Now, see my little donkey? He knows it's a special day now. He says, oh, it's Palm Sunday. This is Nisan 10. And he woke up an ordinary day and his destiny is going to be fulfilled. He gets to introduce the Savior. He gets to exalt Jesus Christ. What a blessing for this little donkey. He fulfilled his prophetic destiny. Now, sometimes you and I feel like a little donkey. We're insignificant, nothing special about us. Like little donkey, our significance is in the fact Jesus has called every one of you, every one of us, and he said, the Lord needs you. He needs every, I don't care how, what your age is. He needs every one of us. He says, you were not created to stay tied up on the post at the city gate. God uses ordinary people, and he will strengthen them. How do you get your strength? It's the relationship you have with him. That's where you get your strength. God comes to untie the ropes that are holding you back, to break every yoke and to to declare to you, your life is not over. You're still breathing? There's much to be done. And there's something significant that each one of us can do, no matter our age. So you see my ropes untied now? Jesus is in the business of untying donkeys. And he needs us all. He wants to break people free from that which is holding them back. Just as the donkey was called by the master to exalt him, you and I have been called out of darkness, and we've been given a new significance to exalt Jesus Christ and to take the Savior to people, to introduce them to who he is. How did the disciples and little donkey respond to Jesus? Humble obedience total faith what was my significance my significance when I was about 60 years old God said you're going to be the mother of a transgender first of all I wasn't sure what it was but then I see now as I look back it's for such a time as this that he brought Laura out such a time as this to, because he brought me through it. So now I get to encourage a lot of mothers and grandmothers who are going through it. You can't, God will sustain you. You can have victory, all these different things. But it exalts Jesus Christ and brings glory to him. He said, Peter, I'm praying for you that your faith won't fail. See, he didn't remove my test. I went through it a long time, about 10 years. He didn't remove the test, but he said, I'm praying that your faith won't fail. And when you return to me, you'll strengthen your brethren. Humble myself before the Lord. Ask to be clothed with his humility. The purpose of my life is to bring glory to God. 
in all things. So now the ropes are all untied. You let go of attitudes and behaviors that are binding you. You're free to be used by Jesus Christ. You be obedient to his call on your life. You're a servant of the king and you're to bring glory to him. That's our purpose. And I want to encourage you through all of this, whatever God has you going through, his grace will not fail you. It will not. His grace is sufficient. And he will lift you out of the darkest pit. He lifted me out of a pretty dark pit. He lifted Laura out of a really dark one. So I'm very thankful for the experience. I, I honest, honestly can say that now. Because not only did he perform a radical change in Laura, it's the most radical thing I've ever seen. And how he's using her. But in the process, he also changed me. So I'm very thankful for the experience. And I just want to show you a little bit the theme for Laura's wedding and her shower that we had here and for her ministry. Look what the Lord has done. And so through all of this, this Bible study was birthed out of it. Come grow with me Bible study. I have been on countless Zoom uh, meetings encouraging mothers from all around the world. My testimony has been uh, translated from Chinese uh, into Chinese and speaking to many of them one night uh, on a Zoom call. But God has just given us all kinds of opportunities. Laura and I have been able to go and speak at different women's conferences, giving her side and me giving the mother's view and the mother's side. We both were uh, privileged with American Family to be in, in his image documentary that's had a major impact on many people out in the world. The prodigal prayer ministry started out of all of this. And even uh, there's a book now published by American Family Association, The Prodigal Prayer Guide. So God has taken this horrific journey <laughs> And he has brought so much good out of it. So many ministry opportunities. Look what the Lord has done. And God has been glorified, I believe, in everything. And so I, I just praise him for that. Someone has said, God never uses anyone until they are first broken and spilled out for him. I'm going to play uh, a CD of my brother's. Uh, most of you know my brother was uh, a missionary. Uh, the Lord called him home in 2007 at the age of 52. And uh, he was a missionary in Alaska. He went back into uh, a lot of the villages where you had to go either in a canoe or something. And he ministered to the people in Alaska for many years. He made a CD six months after he had a stroke. And I am so grateful I have a copy of his CD. And these are the songs that were the reason he became a missionary and had a heart for missions and presenting the gospel to people. And so I've got the words for you, but they're also going to be on the screen. And I just pray that this song will bless your heart. One day a plain village woman Driven by love for her Lord Recklessly poured out a valuable essence Disregarding the score And once it was broken and spilled out, a fragrance filled all the room, like a prisoner released from his shackles, like a spirit set free from the tomb broken and spilled out just 
for love of you, Jesus, my most precious treasure, lavished on Thee. Father, we just come to you, and Lord, I pray that the lessons we 